Welcome to the show. I'm Andy Hagens, and today we're talking about a really cool asset class. I'm guessing even some of the most sophisticated investors in our audience and our listenership haven't really heard of this asset class or, or haven't invested in it. We're talking about micro PE, micro private equity, and it's quietly taking the world by storm. Joining me today is Mike Vrankovich. Did I get that right? Managing partner at Web Street. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, Andy, thank you so much for having me on today. Yeah, that was the perfect pronunciation. I and I, I when I lived in Chicago, and I even trained with uh, you know some Eastern European guys at the local jujitsu gym, and I got a little bit of a crash course on pronunciation, but I still struggle sometimes. But you know, Mike, it's talking about micro PE today. I have seen this concept everywhere in the past three to six months. And it was like two years ago, I'd never heard of it. Like, where did this, it seems like it's overnight. Obviously it wasn't overnight, but where did micro PE come from? I, obviously you've been in it for a while. Could you give us a little, little backstory? Maybe first off, even just define the term for those in our audience who aren't familiar with micro PE. Sure. So micro PE typically much smaller transactions than something a typical private equity firm would touch. So typically under $10 million. Um, with us specifically, we specialize in micro P for online businesses. And it's okay. So a typical PE firm wouldn't touch anything less than 10 million. And then it's also like at a certain really tiny size. I'm like, oh, that's not really private equity anymore. You know, it, for certain types of small businesses, if you purchase them, you're almost just purchasing yourself a job. You know what I mean? So is there, is there like a lower bound with micro PE in your experience? I mean, it, it really depends on, on the buyer and, and what you're buying it for. But, but, it, but you're, you're exactly right. If you buy a business too small that requires a lot of um, owner's time to run it, you're, you're paying a whole bunch of money to buy yourself a job. So it, it really depends on the type of business, how, how actively managed it is and uh, for how much money you can put employees into to operate it. So, so it's, it's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but I don't think I have an exact lower bound. I can give you some examples once we get into it with online businesses, what we typically look for. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I think because I know they're, you know, on your platform, there are very specific business types or models that are almost like plug and play that, you know, that are very complementary to this model. And, you know, other things like if I if I go buy a restaurant for two million dollars, is that technically micro private equity? You know, I, I mean, I suppose it is, but it kind of you know the devil's in the details. It might be more just like I'm I'm an entrepreneur and I'm buying that to you know very actively run it as an entrepreneur. So there's a little bit of gray area, I think, with these terms. But you know, before we dive into Web Street, some of these specific sectors of businesses that you all are dealing with. Why don't we start with your background? How did you end up becoming a managing partner at Web Street and, and working in this very unique micro PE space? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll give you a little, little bit of background. So my background is in finance, specifically derivatives trading. And uh, I started learning about online businesses back in 2014. Um, I saw these online businesses that were making money online. I didn't really understand how it worked. And I saw an opening for a company called Empire Flippers, which is a brokerage firm for online businesses. So they help people buy and sell online businesses, anything from e-commerce to digital advertising websites to software businesses. I ended up joining that, that company, stayed with them for a few years, left, created my own online business, uh, a e-commerce business. And uh, a few years ago, I went back and co-founded uh, WebStreet with the original founders of, of Empire Flippers. So Empire Flippers, it's basically a, a business brokerage, but specializing in online businesses. And if you don't mind, could you, could you maybe walk us through? Because you know, there's so many types of businesses that change hands. But my impression at Empire Flippers, you know, it's, it's I don't want to say a narrow type of business, but there's like particular types that are very commonly bought and sold on that platform. So why don't we talk, why don't we start there? You know what are what are the types of businesses at Empire Flippers and then maybe later on Web Street that are commonly bought and sold that you feel are really uh, kind of the bread and butter of this space? 
Yeah, yeah, good, good, good question. So an online business would be anything that doesn't have a physical location. So a laundromat or a warehouse or uh, something with a retail storefront would not qualify. So it's a business that you can run from anywhere in the world. It can have employees, but not a physical lo location. So the majority of the online businesses being sold on Empire Flippers would roughly fall into a handful of categories. The first one I would call content. Uh, digital advertising. So if you think, so this would be websites that are monetized either with ads or affiliate links. So a common example people are familiar with would be something like New York Times wire cutter, where you're searching for the best uh, luggage to buy. You go on their website, you have a long article that reviews the different types of options, and it has links inside. And when you click on one of the links, it takes you to Amazon and New York Times gets a cut for on, on any purchases made. So that would be, broadly speaking, websites, content. Um, the next category is e-commerce. So businesses that sell products online. The most popular subgroup of that is Amazon FBA. So businesses that sell products on Amazon. What a lot of people don't actually realize, over 60% of the products being sold on Amazon are being sold by third-party sellers. So unless you're buying a very big, famous brand, you're probably buying a private label product uh, that's being run by a small or medium-sized business. So that's that's probably the second biggest monetization. And then you, of course, have uh, SaaS or software as a service. So tools that you pay for a monthly subscription, different types of software tools. And then, and then you have a few other agencies like Digital Books, Kindle, Direct Publishing, uh, agencies, and, and so on. So software e-commerce especially amazon fba and then content you know affiliate type businesses uh and these are businesses you know it's interesting because if if i want to if if i want to go out and acquire uh like a multifamily building or you know a lot of these other types of assets there's a very defined market price range and you know for some online businesses you know they're so unique it can be very, very hard to to come up with any kind of, you know, like what like one person could say this business is worth ten million dollars, and someone else could say it's essentially worthless, you know. But with Amazon FBA and and some of these or or SaaS, you know, once it hits a certain scale, would you say that there's a, a like a market multiple or or a range where, where you know all the participants kind of know this is the going rate for an Amazon FBA store? Yeah, yeah. So, so currently, businesses, let's say in on the micro site, between two hundred thousand dollars and one point two million dollars, they tr they typically sell at three to four x annual earnings, uh, annual net profit, or or free cash flows. So that's that's really what makes these businesses so attractive, because the the multiple or the the ROI on something like that is so much higher than um, than many other investments. Now on the flip side, what makes it difficult as a, as a passive investment is that they require a highly specialized skill set in order to run these businesses and it requires time. They're definitely not passive investments like we were talking about earlier. You might buy one of these businesses and buy yourself a job unless you have a team in place that can, that can run these businesses. So are there, um, are there companies, you know, aside from Web Street, are there private equity firms that are doing like roll-ups that are, you know, buying smaller, you know, so, you know, at SaaS startups and rolling them together that are buying, you know, Amazon FBA accounts, you know, or storefronts that are in a certain range and trying to hit scale? Like, like who is the buyer for most of these types of companies that are transacting? So probably over the last two to four years, we saw a lot of private equity interest, specifically in Amazon FBA um, businesses. So different companies uh, called aggregators, they went out and raised uh, boatloads of money and they've probably raised about 10 to $20 billion over a one wow. to two year period to roll up these Amazon FBA businesses. So typically the strategy has been, let me go out and buy $100, $1 million businesses at a three to four X multiple let me put a team in place to run these businesses and then I'm going to bundle these up or aggregate them and sell them to a um, private equity firm or to another institution at, at a much higher multiple. So, so the space has gotten a lot of, it's, it's been getting a lot more interest from private equity firms 
the the same thing has been around with SaaS, typically for larger SaaS businesses, five, $10 million SaaS businesses. Um, and we haven't quite seen it in, in content yet. So then I, I, Empire Flippers is a broker that is, you know, charging a percentage for for these types of businesses that are sold on that platform, it's it's kind of like an eBay for for these types of businesses. Where does Web Street come in? So so you had started this e-commerce company after you left Empire Flippers, and then you came back, and you guys is it a fund? Is that what Web Street is essentially? Yeah, yeah, it's it's an investment fund, or or more accurately, a investment platform that matches up passive investors and experienced portfolio managers. And I, I wish I could take credit for coming up with the idea, but I definitely didn't. It was one of those things where over the years, many people were asking us to passively invest in online businesses. So they would come to the brokerage and they would say, hey, three to four X annual multiple looks great. It, these assets look, look great, but I have no interest in learning how to run them. I don't have the time. Or if I buy a $500,000 business, I have no interest in buying myself a job that requires a lot of training. How about I just give you some money or how about I buy this business and you run it for me? And the answer has always been no. And we told people no so many times and we kept hearing it over and over again, where we came to the point and realized, well, clearly there's a need here. Clearly there's market demand for people to invest in these online businesses passively because they're, they're cash flow positive, they're trading for low multiples. And, and at the same time, we saw, we saw the same business model applied in many other asset classes. I mean, the most common one is real estate. You, you have many uh, real estate investment platforms that allow people to own fractional shares of real estate investments. Uh, we started seeing the same thing with other alternative investment um, classes, such as uh, artwork. You see Masterworks doing the exact same thing, selling fractional ownership in artwork. Um, we've even seen it in with startups, of course, and then we've seen it in some more um, exotic investment classes like farmland or even wine. So we figured, look, we, we have a proven business model that works with other asset classes. We have the necessary background and experience to do this for e-commerce, and we already have the demand. Well, why don't we just do what people have been asking us to do for, for years? And that's, that's when we launched um, WebStreet, originally actually Empire Flippers Capital, recently rebranded to WebStreet. Understood. Yeah. And, you know, some of those other asset classes you mentioned, you know, obviously with real estate, like with multifamily apartment buildings, you know, people have been syndicating those types of assets for decades with the GPLP model. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned uh, artwork, investment grade artwork, investment grade wine. Um, those are investable asset classes now, right? Absolutely. They're alternative investments. My, I think the drawback to them, and it's, it doesn't mean they're not worth investing in, but they don't have an inherent income stream. And, you know, I think that's what's very appealing about micro private equity. Not only is there an income stream, but uh, at a very surface level, it sounds to me like one of the cheapest possible income streams you could possibly buy, which usually means there's risk. There might be headaches involved, right? Like usually when uh, income stream is cheap, it's cheap for a reason, right? Because of, of risk. Or, you know, you mentioned already you need specialized expertise. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'll, I recently had someone on the show and he was talking about real estate and he said, I come from the school that you make most of your money uh, on the buy side in terms of price paid. So when you're buying Absolutely. things at a three or three or four X multiple, it's it, to me, you're already kind of setting yourself up for success. So talk about the strategy at Web Street. Uh, and, and with your fund, are you are you buying all three? You know the three types of businesses that we mentioned: content, SaaS, Amazon FBA. Are you buying all three of those, or are you specializing in one? Yeah, so 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 we're buying um, all, all all monetizations, and and really the the goal here is to provide maximum diver diversification for investors. And and you touched on this perfectly. You know, when something is trading at a three to four x multiple. Typically, there's more risk involved. Um, one, there's two reasons why it's a low multiple. One, because it's an actively managed asset, and two, because there there is more risk. So, so what what we what we do at Web Street is we work with accredited investors. So far, we've got 350 plus accredited investors. We've raised just over 30 million dollars uh, across 17 different investment funds, bought about 35 different assets. 
And and what we what we do is when we launch a investment fund, we do it in rounds. So we'll typically have a round that has three to five separate portfolio managers. Each portfolio manager will uh, be buying businesses for a different monetization. So there might be one guy buying content websites. There might be one guy doing e-commerce or FBA. There might be somebody else doing Kindle Direct Publishing. There might be somebody doing SaaS. And what we recommend to investors is to not try to pick the winners, but buy the whole basket, buy the whole basket of four different portfolio managers. And each of those portfolio managers will buy multiple assets as well, anywhere from two to five assets. Now, now to go back to the risk part, when you're buying businesses at these multiples of this size, some of these businesses will fail. And we we build that into our model from the ground up. We actually think as many as one out of five businesses will fail. Um, however, the winners make up for it. So as long as you have a diversified portfolio, you can get strong risk adjusted returns. Yeah, and and, and Mike, I, I can speak to that just in the sense that you know how I got into alternative investments. You know, I'm I'm not a financial industry professional, really. I started the show as an LP, just as an investor, as a limited partner in funds. And Jimmy and I, you know, going back now a decade plus, um, you know, we we were entrepreneurs, and you know, part of our model was investing in or buying in businesses. And I had a lot of experience in lead gen, and at, at one point, you know, we were purchasing lead generation websites and you know similar types of multiples, and absolutely some of them would be. Uh, they would basically go belly up. You know, they might be delisted by Google or they might lose their traffic for whatever reason, but then there would be others that they might triple their revenue, right? And so if you're buying something, if you're buying an asset at 3X and and by the way, in some of these assets, the revenue is almost, you know, like with a lot of content businesses, the revenue and earnings are almost the same if they require very little active management. So if the revenue triples, then now your payback period is like 12 months, right? And it doesn't take very many home run acquisitions like that to make that whole blend perform really, really well. So it sounds like those are the kind of economic, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that you're promising home runs, but to use a baseball analogy, you're going to strike out sometimes, you're going to hit some singles, but you're also going to have some home runs and grand slams in this blend, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly it. Especially... If you're out there buying more, multiple assets with that um, with that assumption from the beginning that some will underperform, some will overperform, if you have different managers running the assets, if some of them are content sites and they have the Google risk, like you mentioned, some of them are Amazon e-commerce businesses and they have a whole different set of risks with them. It, it's it's just a much better way to approach this um, uh, the the space. So comparing micro PE to regular private equity. We already talked about, you know, different people might have different answers. You know, when does it stop being micro private equity? And it's just kind of small private equity. And you, I think you mentioned $10 million, you know, acquisition price. Well, um, it's, it's probably, it's probably a little bit of a moving target too. Yeah. So private equity firms have come down over time. So before they wouldn't, they probably wouldn't touch anything under 50 million. Now we're seeing private equity come come down to lower prices, and it depends from firm firm to firm. It depends on the interest rate environment a little bit, how how much uh, they can lever up the deals. So it's definitely a, a moving target. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. But but aside from whatever the target is, what are the other differences? Um, you know, with with micro private equity, it, it it's higher risk. Would you say in general than than standard private equity? Uh it. It depends. Um, I mean, one, one of the challenges, of, of course, that, that you mentioned earlier is um, running these assets in, in such a way that doesn't eat up all of your returns. So if you're doing, if you're buying a $100 million business, you've got a lot more cash flow to spend on putting a team in place and running it. You have scale, right? You have, you have, you have scale. scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's definitely more challenging some of these smaller businesses may have been around for a shorter period of time. Going back to your Google example, um, if, if there's less track record, it's harder to project how it will do in the future. It's also one of, one of the reasons why there, is, uh, why there tends to be a, a lot of opportunity. It's a, uh, it's a fairly new market. I mean, Empire Flippers has been around for 10 plus years. There's a handful of players, uh, bigger players in the space like Empire Flippers, 
Uh, there's a lot of small players, and it's a little bit like the Wild West. Uh, the other thing is when you're buying you know, a $500,000 business, you can't hire an outside due diligence firm that you're going to pay 100 grand to do full due diligence because that will eat up all the profits as well. So you have to figure out how to apply the same things that the private equity players do with their acquisitions and with managing the businesses with much smaller businesses. But the upside is, are the multiples. So, so then at, at like a web street, I mean, it, it almost, it almost sounds to me like in a, in a way that you all are competing with some of these private equity firms that are doing the rollups, right? So I don't want to, uh, let me just kind of imagine this, if I may, as an entrepreneur, sure. I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and game this out. And then you can tell me if, if I'm right or wrong, I'd be thinking, well, you know, if there's going to be multiple funds and if each fund is acquiring multiple assets, and if we do this multiple years, we could almost have an in-house Amazon FBA team, or you know, maybe, maybe there's a couple people on a marketing team that specialize in optimizing for the Amazon search algorithm or Amazon paid ads or whatever. That you could actually gain efficiency by by having you know resources in place, a team in place, where you actually do have that expertise and you are hitting a certain scale. Maybe not the hundred million dollar scale. But you mentioned you you already have thirty million dollars in assets. So, so do, are you working to build that, or or do you already have that expertise in house that can then be applied as you launch new funds? It's like, well, we already have this proven team. Yes. So we we've taken a slightly different approach. We definitely have in house resources that help our operators and portfolio managers do due diligence, negotiate on the acquisitions. Like you said earlier, a lot of the money is made on the buy. Um, that provide oversight on a, on, a, on a regular basis, communicated with investors and so on. But we've taken the approach of instead of running the assets in-house, we partner with operators or portfolio managers that have a track record of, uh, of, mm. of building, buying, and selling these businesses. And that really comes from our brokerage background. So my co-founders build this brokerage, and as a result of running this brokerage for a decade, they, they can see what sellers continue coming back to the brokerage and that are repeat sellers. So they're serial entrepreneurs of these, of these small online businesses, but you can oftentimes, you can even see them buying a business, improving it a year or two later, selling the business. So as a result of that, we had this big network of online business uh, sellers that, that have the right skill set to be uh, portfolio managers. And instead of us trying to do it in-house, like we talked about earlier, if the goal is to have different types of monetizations and different types of business models, each of those business models requires a very, very different skill set to run the business. So a software company is very different than an e-commerce company, than a content or, or digital advertising business. Mm -hmm. So instead of running them in-house, we partner with the portfolio managers that already have a track record of uh, buying and selling their own businesses and, and of course, growing them. Well, Mike, that's a lot better than my idea. Uh, that makes it a lot more. <laughs> no, but but really, because you know, if you were trying to bite off, I suppose, and you know, have you having said that, I'm thinking, well, if I'm trying to bite off running micro businesses in software, in Amazon FBA, in content, then each of those things have their little idiosyncrasies. They're almost their own departments, you know, like with a content site. Social media is its own thing. YouTube is its own thing. We got it. We have to make YouTube thumbnails. Well, you have to have a specific team member that knows how to make YouTube. Th I mean, just the complexity. It's it it it's it's one of those things where there are there's so much happening operationally and spread across so many assets that it sounds to me you guys have figured out. Well, this is how we need to do it to scale because even if you have one really good portfolio manager. There's only so many assets that that portfolio manager can realistically run, right? It, it, exactly. I mean, that's that's really it. And and what what we do with the portfolio managers, we're, we're actually solving a big problem for for them as well. If you're buying one million dollar online businesses, it's really really difficult to get traditional financing. So if you walk into a bank and you try to get a loan for your uh, for this website that you're buying, the first thing that they ask for, great, show me your lease. And you're like, well, I'm buying a website. The whole point is to not have a lease to keep the expenses down. Uh, right. So so traditional bank finance, financing has been close to impossible. Right. Uh, so you have these experienced serial entrepreneurs that have previously bought businesses, grown them, and sold them. 
that want to do the exact same thing that they've done before, but they want to do it with leverage and there's no way for them to do it. And that's, and that's why they come, come and join us. So, so they come, they, they partner with us. Uh, they go out and buy the businesses. We deal with, with the investors. We raise the money from investors. We provide the, the oversight and they, they put in money on every single deal um, that they, that they buy. They put, they usually co-invest about 5%. And then they get leverage uh, in form of carried interest, like like a traditional uh, fund, like you'd expect. So then there's really, there's essentially two GPs. Then there's uh, Empire Flippers or Web Street. You, got, you all putting the offering together, doing the oversight, and then the portfolio manager um, sort of on the ground level uh, is the other Correct. GP there. Okay. C- Correct. And, and really the what's in it for the portfolio managers they're looking to come to us, build up a track record with investors, then come back, do a second and larger fund, and get to the point where they're doing uh, one or two funds a year. And, and m- most, most of these portfolio managers already have existing teams. Most of them are running their own portfolios. Some of them in the past had investors, and I've found that they really want to focus on what they enjoy and what they do best, which is buying and, and growing these businesses versus legal, versus accounting and compliance and so on. Is there anyone out there who's doing anything like this in terms of, I mean, I, I know that we talked about their private equity firms, um, but you, you know, that are, that are doing roll-ups in the micro PE space with like Amazon FBA or SAS or whatever. But I, I, I would guess that they're not syndicating those offerings to, you know, kind of everyday accredited investor, you know, Jane and Joe accredited investor down the street. Is there, is there anyone that even that is competing against you or that's even kind of roughly in the space or do, are you just inventing it in a real time? <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're the first <laughs> one to do, to do this in with e-commerce, with online businesses. But like I mentioned before, very common for real estate, common with, with other types of asset classes. Now, now there are other players in our space that, that do it the, the way you mentioned. They'll, they'll build a team, they'll raise money, they'll go out and buy, buy their, the businesses and run them in-house. But mm-hmm. as far as I know, there's nobody that does it across different monetizations with different portfolio managers all competing for investor money based on performance. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can, I can speak to this as an entrepreneur. And, and again, I, you know, I've, I've done a roll-up before. I've done a media company, done a lead generation company. So I've, I've had experience scaling different types of companies. And my experience is every company, every startup, every small business, they have like a DNA, right? Like if you're a lead gen company, it's like lead gen is just in your DNA. It's how you think your systems all revolve around that. I've never done e-commerce or Amazon FBA, but I imagine that sort of business, it has its own DNA. Software, it has its own DNA. I mean, it's culture, different cultures, different ways of thinking, totally different business models. So I think you, if you tried to run three different, totally disparate business models under one roof, you're going to run into trouble real fast. So my guess is all those kind of roll-ups are really just in one vertical, right? They're just a SaaS roll-up or they're just an FBA roll-up. Correct. Correct. And, and, and the really interesting thing here, if you look, this is probably true for, for many types of businesses, but you definitely see this with online businesses. It almost requires a different DNA or a different type of skill set to take a business from zero to one to being worth one million dollars versus taking it from one to five and then from five to 50 very very different skill sets so that's that's what we try to do we try to buy these businesses that are run by solo entrepreneurs they're maxed out in in their ability to grow the business and then we have somebody come on board that has done the exact same thing before understood so i want to zoom out then because outside of the the fund aspect of this I am seeing more and more entrepreneurs or uh, what's the word? Is it entrepreneurs want to be entrepreneurs, <laughs> you know, but there's, this seems like it to, to me, it was like overnight. Um, like I follow Cody Sanchez on, on Twitter and get her newsletter. I think she's a real interesting person with a lot of great mm-hmm. content, but she has a huge following. And I'm like, all of a sudden now micro private equity seems like it's this big thing. And then now I'm seeing like 50 other people hockey and you know micro acquisitions on facebook or twitter or, or whatever was this always around and i wasn't seeing it or is micro private equity you like really having a moment now in 2023 i mean it's it's probably a lot more visible especially from the like you call it the the entrepreneur side mm-hmm. um 
where you know more more people are working remotely, which gives people the opportunity to start their own business or pretend like they're starting their own business, depending <laughs> how cynical you 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 want it, you want to be about it. So it's probably a lot more visible. And of course, there's always a lot of money made in um, in selling courses, selling digital products because the margins are so high. Unfortunately, you know there are some really good courses, really good products out there. And there's some products that have really great sales and marketing material, but the the products are crap. I mean, I, I remember from you know from a long time ago when I was in um, proprietary trading, if you saw anybody selling a course or even talking about their strategy, yeah. you immediately knew that it didn't work. It's like I don't know anything about the strategy, but I know everything I need to know. It doesn't work, otherwise they wouldn't be selling it. What's funny? I think it was this morning I saw an ad on social media. That was about micro private equity buying businesses using AI. And it's like, don't buy businesses the hard way, use AI. And I'm thinking, wow, this person literally just combined like two buzzwords. They just like combined micro private equity with AI. They just were like, I'll just combine two. And I, I have to admit, though, the marketer in me respected them. I'm like, well, that's a good hook. That's probably pulling some people in, but I, I doubt they're going to have success, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you're seeing that in in uh, VC uh, investments as well. Everybody, ev everybody is uh, rebranding themselves as an AI or AI enabled company now. Right. Well, I'm I'm human, everyone. Uh, this show, <laughs> it's gonna yeah. I, and you know, people talk about writing their newsletter with AI. I'm like, I don't want to read your AI newsletter. Okay, if you want me to read your newsletter. You're gonna have to do it the hard way. So, uh, and that's that's one thing I like about YouTube, at least to date, from what I understand. If I'm if I see a human being on YouTube, I assume it's not like a robot, but that may even change with AI. Um, you know what? I got to get off this. This is a this is a side path. Back to back to micro PE. <laughs> I want to know how big can this get? You know, with Web Street, you mentioned it's gotten bigger that you're scaling. You're now up to thirty million or so in AUM. Um, so, so it's obviously not huge yet, but it, it also sounds like you have momentum and now you're beginning to have this track record. What is the, what does the growth path look like, you know, from web streets point of view, uh, if you're comfortable sharing how, how big yeah, do you of think course. this could get? Yeah. So, so our, our target is to get to the point where we're deploying $150 million in capital per year on new acquisitions. I think we can get there within the next, uh, three to four years. And could that amount of, is that capital all deployed within the Empire Flippers capital network or some of it, can it be deployed externally? I guess what I'm getting at is, are there enough businesses being transacted that, that you know, there are good acquisition targets just on your platform or are you kind of, are you more platform agnostic where you'll do an acquisition wherever you find it? So completely platform agnostic, that, that was actually one of the big reasons for the rebrand. So when we launched, we launched as a completely separate company, but sister company, same brand in the name as Empire Flippers Capital, uh, basically the, the investment arm. We always knew at some point that we would have to split off, and that's what we just recently completed uh, roughly six months ago. And after we completed our, our rebrand, our no, no, we no longer have any shared resources with Empire Flippers, um, and now we're buying businesses from anywhere. We bought from direct competitors, so other brokerages. We bought from private deal flow. And the biggest reason is exactly what, why you pointed out. In order to be able to deploy that much capital and continue delivering strong returns, we need to be able to buy businesses from everywhere. So yeah, so I, I think 150 million a year is very, very realistic, especially if you look at what uh, the Amazon FBA aggregators did. Um, they they probably haven't been able to deploy as much money as they raised, and they have been not doing as well uh, as they did before. But they've been able to deploy massive amounts of capital. Yeah, wow that that is so interesting. And and you know, in a sense, Amazon in and of itself is such a huge ecosystem, and there's constantly new products, new accounts, new brand, you know, private label brands launching on it. So I mean, even just taking Amazon. Software is another one, obviously, with, um, you know, with SaaS, there's every day, there's probably 50 new startup <laughs> uh, <laughs> software companies. But, you know, it's, it seems to me with Amazon FBA, there's going to be so much of, of that skill set 
that it's going to be very tightly aligned with one acquisition to the next. With SaaS, I feel like that might be a nightmare where, you know, I, I buy a software company and the whole thing is, is uh, I'm just, I don't know much about software programming languages, so go easy. But I, I might buy one, it's <laughs> written in Python, and the next one is C Sharp, and the next one is Ruby. These are probably all like 10 years out of date, but mm -hmm. it, is it is it harder to aggregate software companies because there's more disparate technologies? Or are you finding that you can still successfully kind of your, your portfolio managers rather, are they able to purchase those and hit some so, sort of efficiency? So, so I'm, I'm definitely not, not a developer either. So if there's any programmers listening, um, <laughs> you'll be able to tell right, right away. Yeah. But, but it seems like the, the most challenging thing isn't as much the, the tech stack or the programming language, or even the, the operations of the SaaS. it's really the, the marketing, how to market and grow the business. So what are. SaaS operators or what our SaaS portfolio managers are looking at is to stay in a fairly tight niche that they've been in before. So one, um, one portfolio manager that we'll be raising money for over the next few months is, is a SaaS operator, and he'll be buying businesses that are specifically SaaS businesses that are building tools for other software developers. Um, and that's, that's his niche. That's the type of businesses he's bought in the past. That's the type of types of businesses he's known how to grow because he understands the market and mm -hmm. he understands those businesses. He, he understands how to acquire new customers profitably. He understands how to add new features that they care about and that they want. And his, his background is, for example, this guy, he is a developer, so he knows how to develop, but he spends very little time developing. He, he has a team of developers that, that do the majority of the, of the coding. Understood. Well, uh, I mean, Mike, this is fascinating. I, I hope our, our viewers and listeners will take the time to check out Web Street. I mean, it, if nothing else, um, you all, I, I feel, are pioneering the space in terms of being an asset manager and allowing LPs, you know, again, you know, just the high net worth investors where you don't need to be an institutional or family office to invest in this private equity fund that has like a $10 million minimum or something. It's it, this type of investment, truly passive, much more accessible now uh, to all accredited investors. So, Mike, where can our audience of high net worth investors go to learn more about Web Street and your current offerings? Uh, sure. Webstreet.co. So, Webstreet.co, you can go on there, find all of this information. There's a way to sign up for the platform. It takes, uh, it's, it's a very easy sign up. Obviously it's only open, like we talked about, it's only open to accredited investors. So you're going to need to verify that you're an accredited investor. But after that, even if we don't have any, any investment deals open, we typically have investment rounds two to four times a year. But if there's nothing there, once you have access to the platform, you can look at the past deals that we've done. And, and you can see in details how the monetizations work, what type of acquisitions we look for and so on. So you won't be able to invest in the past deals, but you'll be able to see more of our track record and, and so on. Thanks, Mike. This has been uh, so fascinating. And as a reminder to our viewers and listeners, our show notes are always available at wealthchannel.com. So I'll be sure to link to all these, all these links for Web Street in our show notes. Mike, thanks again for joining the show today. Thank you so much, Andy. It was great, great being here.